Well, first of all, it's great to uh, have Andy Mia here. So I'm Steve Fuller. Uh, I'm a, a professor of sociology at the University of Warwick in the UK, but for this year, I'm at the uh, Kitte Hamburger Kolleg uh, in Aachen in Germany, a new research institute developed, devoted to the cultures of research. And it's a great pleasure to have Andy Mia here. Andy uh, is someone I've known for a long time. Uh, and in a sense, this is a man, the reason why we want to interview him in the context of this conference is this is a man whose life has been about cyborgs in all of its various dimensions. It's a career in cyborgs, basically, okay? Um, and, and in that respect, you, you will start to realize cyborgs have been around for a long time. Uh, and so, uh, what, uh, when I, so Andy's position, and this is an interesting, st interesting starting point, right? So you might, want, we've been talking about different sorts of, of contexts, academic contexts, uh, and non-academic context in which uh, the cyborg arises as something to deal with. And so it's interesting to, uh, as, as I understand, Andy, I know, I know that perhaps the name of your chair changes, uh, but, but as I understand, you're a chair of science communication and future media. That's, uh, okay. Um, so science communication and future media, this is a very appropriate kind of way of characterizing the context in which the cyborg plays a role increasingly in our society. Um, and the university where uh, Andy is, the University of Salford. Now, again, for those of you who are not from the UK, um, if you want to think about Salford uh, as a place, um, you know, um, again, uh, I'm assuming you know something about, if you know something about New York City, you know there's a certain kind of relationship between Manhattan and Brooklyn. Salford is Brooklyn. <laughs> and it looks like Brooklyn. I, I know, I lived there once. It looks, it's red brick. It's got all this kind of Brooklyn look to it. And, and if you, and the river relationship, uh, the East River, in the case of New York, um, is similar too. Um, but as it turns out, Salford is the place where the BBC has relocated a lot of its operations. So now um, you, you go to Salford and you see something called Media City, which Andy has been very much involved in. Um, and, and, and this is the context, okay, um, in, 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 in which I think it's very useful to talk about cyborgs because cyborgs are obviously interfacing with many kinds of aspects of our lives, including the technological ones and the mass technological ones. And, and we've talked about this a bit in the conference so far. Uh, and in a sense, it's very useful to talk to Andy because in a sense, I see this, I see him as having gone through a journey, as it were, a journey through cyborganization uh, in all of its various phases. He's written a lot, he's written a lot of books and so forth. In fact, uh, I first ran across Andy uh, actually on television, okay, uh, and, and he was on Newsnight, which is the uh, main late evening public affairs program in the UK, and I guess this was, what, 10, 15 years ago, um, and, 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 I, and I believe you were talking about um, issues having to do with athletes uh, taking drugs and so forth, which was a really big issue, um, and, and, and this was the subject of what I believe was your first book, Right, your first book was on this issue about uh, athlete uh, doping, uh, and in this, even in this book, which uh, what was it, twenty oh seven? I mean, it was twenty oh four. Okay, so we're talking a long time ago, people. Some of you may not even <laughs> been born. Um, that 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 um, in this book, uh, there is already discussion of cyborgs. Right, there is already discussion of cyborgs in the content, in the context, right, of doping in sports, which we haven't talked about here yet. Uh, and indeed, one of the things that we haven't talked about is the entire sporting context in which cyborgs play, play a role, both as a concept and as a realization. And, and so what I'd like to do, Andy, to begin this uh, is to uh, get a sense of, of how the, the, the sport and doping thing, how you got into all this together, how, how this becomes, because this seems to me the entry point for you. Can you say a little bit about that before we yeah, go further? Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. And actually, I may take you back a bit earlier because um, so my journey as a, as a researcher began in 1998, really. And uh, I was interested in uh, 
broadly technological change, but specifically in the context of sports, partly because I could see that athletes, elite athletes are symbolically, if not literally, pushing the boundaries of human potential through their pursuit of groundbreaking records or indeed the integration of technological and scientific processes in their practice. So it was a fascinating subject to look at this subject through the lens of sport. But the first book I actually published was an edited volume that was part of the, the journal Research in Philosophy and Technology, which was at least then under the editorship of Professor Carl Mitchum. Uh, and that book deals with the sort of historical, philosophical and ethical aspects of technological change within sports, which I think are a, a good way of, of understanding that broader context to the cyborg, certainly in the sort of 70s and 80s, and, and how it then informed discussions that led up to the book on genetically modified athletes. And that was you know, an interesting moment for me because I went through, uh, I guess, a fascination of, of just understanding what genetics could do. And remember reading an, an article in the popular science magazine, New Scientist, which was about the possibility of identifying performance genes. So here we have now the cusp of the completion of the Human Genome Project, married with this idea that the consequence of it would be to then radically transform humanity through designer technologies. And I think we're, it's only probably another 20 or 30 years later that we see sort of that becoming a possibility now. But it's, it's that wider context to sport that I think really fascinated me, that there is a, a kind of disconnect between the regulators or the expectations that people have as audience members or spectators and the ethos of elite athletes to push the boundaries of, of what's possible. And, um, and I was very much aware, sort of working within a sports science school focused on bioethics, how in fact the things that reach the level of kind of public discourse on doping and, and stuff like that, is just the tip of the iceberg of the things that athletes do to push their boundaries. And in those early years, I mean, the conversation was, what about genetic modification? Back in 2001, I was a, a resident at the Olympic Committee in Switzerland and, and spoke to the then medical director about their emerging concern that genetic doping would become a possibility and a reality in elite sports. And there's nothing they could do about it because there was no detection test. So essentially they would face a complete undermining of the anti-doping movement, which has been going for a good 60 years and, uh, and genetics would change the playing field completely. So so it's that that's always interested me, the ways in which sort of cyborg technologies disrupt a sense of not of not just of who we are, but how we relate to each other in the practices that we enjoy and um, and and how often those people that are kind of outliers or um, I mean, the sports world would just call them cheats. But I think often they're actually people that want to go further and push the boundaries. Okay, let me, let me stop you there, because this is where it gets interesting, because you, <laughs> you're on the side of the cheats, basically, to put a, yeah. make a long story short, right? Uh, and, and, and so one of the things that you highlighted in your answer is that there's a difference in the perception uh, between the athletes themselves, who, as you portrayed, it seems to me, is that they're pro-doping, basically, uh, and, and the audience Right. And the people, you know, who, who are, you know, maybe even the, the funders of sports, I don't know, um, who are kind of anti-doping. Is that, I mean, how do you explain this kind of dichotomy of orientation? I mean, I think there's a, there's a, a way, a need to sort of unravel what doping is. I think the, the work that I was doing initially was, was in a context where, in fact, there were no rules on genetic modification. So what's always interested me in the sports case is not so much how we apply the rules once they're set, but what the rules should be in the first place. And, and that conversation is the one that I was having more with the international community, because actually, you know, most athletes will say they're against doping. They're against anything that would place them at a disadvantage, an unfair disadvantage in their competitive sphere. That's the principal concern. The, the fact that they sort of are massively modifying themselves in lots of ways is neither here nor there. It's simply about whether, in fact, they're unfairly disadvantaged and that's why everyone in sport hates doping but the problem is the problem i mean i went to a conference in in sydney in 1999 this is the world's first conference on human rights and sport you know the sorts of issues they were dealing with were kids in china eight years old being taken to sort of sports camps to become the next olympic athletes and you know potentially abused in the process um, which is something that was revealed by the bbc through matthew pinston when he went to beijing and went to china in advance of the beijing olympics but this conference, I gave the paper, what are the rights of the genetically modified athlete? And it wasn't so much thinking about an athlete that today or back then 
decides to use a, a form of gene therapy that can then potentially enhance themselves. It was more thinking about what happens or what do we do with the offspring of genetically modified people who then subsequently have an enhanced or optimized um, genome. Because that's the problem I think really crazy, oh. uh, really frustrates the rules that we have at the moment is that actually they might work for what we have at the moment, but they're not going to work in a future where the cyborg is um, omnip omnipotent and I think pre prevalent in lots of different forms. Yes, but of course, um, you know, just because somebody's gen genetically modified in their lifetime, it doesn't follow that... Uh, that their offspring are going to have exactly the same traits that were exhibited by the person who was genetically modified. I mean, there's always an element of chance. And there's a, so in a sense, genes themselves are always sporting, right? Genes, uh, genes always have a sporting quality to them, right? Um, so, so that shouldn't worry people too much. If they're, if they're allowing genetic modification, they should not worry about what the offspring will be like, because you really don't know what the offspring are going to be like. Uh, I, I, I mean, to some extent, I think that we have sort of, we have, uh, there's a lot of, uh, one of the things if you go to the Olympic Games, if you're an athlete, one of the things they, they hand out to all the athletes is condoms. And it's because there's a lot of, a lot of stuff. But isn't this superstition? But no, but isn't this kind of, this yeah. is superstition from a purely genetic standpoint, right? In the sense that genes play their own game. We play our games. We're trying to game the system and the genes have their own game. Right, uh, and and we're trying to gain that, right? But but at the end, they they rule. So so in a sense, who cares? Well, I think the I think that's, that's part, I think that's partly right. I think certainly if you take something like endurance capability as a way of let's imagine you could select the capacity for. In, you know, being a great long distance runner, for example, um, we know that genetic research has, has taught us that there are you know, over 100 polymorphisms of, of genes related to endurance that would need to be selected for. We know that elite athletes have typically around 12 to 15 of these and that the mere mortals probably have a lot less generally. And obviously the gene isn't enough. It needs to be combined with that environmental situation to allow people to then make the most out of it. But I think that the, the challenge is that actually in elite sports, we are dealing with frag, you know, tiny differences that make huge impacts on where you end up in the playing field. And so anything that is seen to potentially enhance is already considered to be sort of suspicious or something of concern. So yeah, it's no guarantee, I think, but it's something that may increase chances. And, um, and I think that was the, that was the world that, the, that is the world that, that sport's not quite ready for still. And we saw that played out particularly in the in the events leading up to the 2012 Olympics with Oscar Pistorius, that the idea of the cyborg is still something that, that sports worlds are very uncomfortable with. And there's a small anecdote I can give you. Back in 2006 and but 7. Isn't Oscar Pistorius a bit different? I mean, aren't we kind of pushing the issue a little bit? Because because what you started talking about was about genetic enhancement in what we might call normal homo sapiens athletes. When we get to Oscar Pistorius wearing the whatever, the skis, whatever, you know, for feet, I mean... Um, you know, the, 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 this is a different terrain, isn't it? I don't think it is because it all pivots on what the world of sport or what the world more generally regards to be acceptably normal. So if you look at the parameters of what's acceptably normal in Paralympic activity, um, you cannot use a prosthetic that is outside of the normal range of what your body would have prescribed, what it would have had, in fact, if you had biological versions of, of your of legs similarly the the, the sports um the paralympic committee would not allow people to have extraordinarily long or differently sort of constructed limbs so there's a notion of what is normal around which that uh, moral framework gravitates that i think applies both in the context of doping and in the context of prosthetics it's essentially a traditionalist view of what being human and what being an athlete involves and that i think is is a profound influence on what is considered to be acceptable as a way of life. And this is, uh, I think, this is why I think it fits into the broader sort of cyborg discourse, because it's, it's often about us and them. It's about whether, in fact, we, we are comfortable with transitioning into a different state of, of being human. Okay, you raised a couple of issues here I want to go back to, okay. Um, the first one, though, I want to take you back a little bit to one of the things you said a few minutes ago concerning um, the issue of uh, the rules. Mm. The rules uh, of competition, especially in light of the doping stuff and how 
you know, because it's not just doping in, in the sense of people taking drugs, but of course, there's always been changes in the, the kinds of bicycles people are riding, right? The kinds of clothes people wear when they compete, right? And because, and, and, and to some extent, this is supposed to give some advantage, you know, aerodynamic, whatever, right? I mean, so this is all part of the cyborg discourse as well, it seems to me, with regard to the Olympics. And so with regard to how one thinks about rules, is the tendency on the part of the Olympic Committee, which ultimately, because the way you introduced the issue was there were no rules, right? Uh, and that rules had to be made up, as it were, um, in order to accommodate new situations. Mm -hmm. What do you, do you have a sense of, as it were, the implicit legal philosophy about how one makes up rules under these circumstances? Uh, because, um, you know, in, in the context of, let's say, uh, coming up with new businesses, right, new kinds of corporate formations, right, that defy these sort of established laws, right, um, and they're trying to establish a sense of legal personhood, right, they'll say, we're different, right, we need a new, new set of laws, you just can't extend the laws as they already exist, right, we need a new set of laws, you know, and, and we should be, you know, we should, you know, change the criteria by which we judge something to be fair or unfair, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, what, what is your thinking in terms of the implicit legal philosophy of something like the Olympic Committee that, that actually has to deal with these kinds of matters on a regular basis? I think if you look historically at the Olympic Committee, you will see in the 1960s, the creation of a medical commission that was born out of a situation where an elite cyclist died on television and was subsequently found to have had things in their body that they ought not to have had and that were then concluded to be instrumental in their death. Um, so big televisual monument that leads to a new commission that's set up. And over the last 50 years, that sense of concern, I mean, the previous Olympic Committee president was a surgeon, um, the present one's a lawyer. I think that there, and in fact, there have been a series of, of specific individuals over the last 50 years that have still been in that community the entire time who, um, who are essentially doctors, Steve. They are people that are anxious about the utilization of medical resources for what they consider to be non-medical purposes. And that's what underpins the doping um, industry, I would describe. And I think that's and it, it sort of bears fruit in, in terms of your question about legal philosophy in every sort of uh, moment before an Olympic uh, city is selected where and this has happened a few times there's a very uh, pr a prominent figure in the Olympic uh, committee called Arne Lundqvist professor in Sweden uh, Karolinska Institute uh, now over 80 years old and every time the cities present themselves as potential Olympic hosts I mean not every time but quite often he will ask will you have a, a law that, that has consequences for doping behaviours? And this is now seen as a, a prerequisite to ensure that the, sit, the country in which these activities are happening go down a journey where they do start to criminalise uh, doping behaviours. And I think that is, again, born out of the concern as a doctor that, he, that these resources are not to be used here, but also the wider sense that that this is broadly detrimental to society to encourage this kind of behavior. But the problem is for me, Steve, is that actually a lot of the doping debate has got really subsumed into a wider war on drugs that we still see prominent in societal discourses. It's ultimately concerned about drug taking. And a lot of the practices that athletes do aren't anything like drug taking. And yet they're still sort of brought into this fold because I think of that, that wider drug discourse. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I just want to make get you to say something to just clarify a point you were just making mm -hmm. about because um, it seems to me you're, you're you're saying that the Olympic Committee actually has a kind of relatively strong sense between medical and non medical uses of drugs. Okay, um, now. What is the criteria of non-medical other than, you know, so, so, so um, the example that you raised uh, was of these elite athletes taking stuff that ended up killing them, okay? Yeah. Um, so that's obviously non-medical in the sense that it's the exact opposite of medical. It kills you. Um, <laughs> but but, but um, is that kind of where the uh, argument is coming from? Or is there some more principled argument that's against enhancement? I think there's an element of both, Steve. I think the way in which it is is operationalized in the codes that underpin elite sports is on the medical argument. But I'll give you a specific example. If you have a form of 
enhancement, let's say a sort of cyborg technology that you want to be using as an athlete, um, what will happen is the, uh, the not the Olympic Committee, because of many years ago, maybe 20 years ago, they, they sort of sectioned off the anti-doping uh, comp component of what they do from the Olympic Committee. So there's a sort of distance between them to avoid conflicts. And they will ask three questions. They will ask whether this thing or process or whatever it might be is enhancing performance. They'll ask that question first. They'll also ask whether it's a risk to health. Uh -huh. And then they'll also ask whether it's against the spirit of sport. Now, if it, if it checks two out of those three boxes, they will consider it as a possible doping technology. And, and it ranges across so many things. So autologists, um, you know, blood, blood transfusions that are, are part of the anti-doping code. So there's a range of things from synthetic products to simply just re-injecting your own blood to then boost your red blood cell counts, which are part of this. Even overtraining, Steve, is actually a, a, a doping offense. So, so really? there's a kind of, yeah, there's like a sweet spot as to what you can actually do in order to be competitive in sport. How, how do they, what is it that they're measuring to, t to determine that you've overtrained? It's a very good question, Steve, because I think that the measurements over the years have also changed as with this discourse. So at the moment, we're moving into what's, what's being described as a genetic passport, essentially looking at a range of biomarkers and identifying variants as a basis for determining suspicion. And that means, of course, that it's often the case that you can have people that are excluded from participation without actually having done anything. But it's considered to be that you're not fit for competition. And that's enough to then um, exclude you from from the from the event. So so, again, that's why I go back to this idea that it gravitates around a certain sense of what is normal functioning for our species, even if it's you know at the personal level. And outside of that range, into the range of that I would describe as the kind of cyborg technologies range is where sports world isn't terribly comfortable. And you see that in lots of different ways, very anecdotally as well. The former IOC president, when hyperbaric chambers were being discussed as a way of increasing sort of uh, endurance capabilities. So essentially, these are spaces that simulate different levels of altitude where you'll be aware that athletes sometimes go to a mountainous area and then move back to a low area in order to enhance their performance. And in the past, you could only do that by literally traveling. Now we can simulate these, but the science has evolved in such a way that we now have different theories about how to do that more effectively. Maybe intervals of different altitudes can enhance your performance. Well, back then, I remember a story that came around where the former IOC president you know, was talking to an athlete about this, and he didn't like the idea of this. That this was something that seemed very anti-natural. And I think there is a sort of naturalness normative position amongst certain people in the sports community that underpins this anxiety about technological change. There is a, a desire to, I think, retain, and you see this in the Olympic Games, I mean, a desire to retain that sense of heritage of the, of the natural and normal human that I think many of these things does not cohere with and is then treated with as suspicious. Okay, um, so let me just make a bookmark as to what we're gonna talk about after what we will be talking about now. So the thing that we're gonna talk about after we talk about now uh, is gonna be about your point about the transitioning into being a cyborg. But before we get, cause you mentioned that in, in passing in one of your remarks, and, and this is actually quite a contested issue in the context of this conference where people are sort of positioning the cyborg in different ways. But before we get to that, I want you to uh, talk to us about the Lance Armstrong obituary. <laughs> yeah. No, because I think this is really interesting with this thing you wrote, right, almost 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I want you to, to contextualize it. And you might have to begin by telling people who Lance Armstrong is, uh, because you know how the world is, people forget stuff. Um, and so give us a little story about the Lance Armstrong obituary. Uh, okay, so for those that don't know Lance Armstrong, Lance Armstrong is or was a, a, a Tour de France cyclist, a very prolific and, and successful cyclist who became, I think, regarded as the sort of ultimate athlete, certainly in the cycling world, who was winning everything. And obviously the Tour de France being this symbolic of event of, of it being you know, arguably one of the most challenging, certainly the most challenging mainstream events in the world. And yet he won it over and over and became this symbol of just human excellence and, and the optimal athlete that you can imagine and then of course over time it was apparent that there were suspicions about what he was doing or not doing uh, he also had cancer which also then 
made this even sort of richer as a kind of heroes and villain story but it's um but the, the the short version is that he was then found guilty of 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 doping and went from being hero to zero and um and so we have and we, this happens a lot in sports we we know this over time that that those athletes that we think of as heroes then can be revealed to be villains and and then brought down and all, all the things that they've done are then brought into question and uh, and lance armstrong was one of those people um, and we've, we've seen lots of people over the years that have gone th through that process, sometimes perhaps um, uh, based on accurate knowledge about what's happened, sometimes based on uh, an absence of evidence that nevertheless leads them to be excluded from the sport or, or found subsequently guilty of doping. Um, so the the idea of the idea of writing the obituary of Lance Armstrong, who is still not dead, of course, um, <laughs> to point that out essentially. Yes, he's um, uh, he's only what fifty. Yeah, yeah, it's not that, but older than that, I think. But yeah, not not uh, not too not not too far ago. One thing I would just add at this, but actually, by the way, the um, it was nineteen ninety eight, I think, maybe ninety seven, that in the Tour de France, um, which of course cycling has been for many years a sport that has been rife with sort of doping practices, and in the Tour de France, I think it was nineteen ninety eight, in the seventeenth leg of the Tour de France, all the cyclists had a protest sit down you can find the videos online about this so we've got this race going on and that morning i believe the police were raiding the kind of team sites to look for i guess evidence of, of drug taking and um in sort of protest of this the, the the cyclists all sort of had this sit down in, in the middle of the race so there's a lot of i guess ambivalence not an ambivalence but very wide range of perspectives on on the role of performance enhancing technologies in cycling, um, which speak to this idea that there's, you know, some people would say that in fact, in order to push the limits, you have to use these technologies. Otherwise you just stay sort of within the realms of what biology can do. And I certainly subscribe to the idea that sports performances, in fact, all the things we do are a kind of interaction of, of sort of nature and technology. And so think about these things as, as very much integrated and in the context of sport, what we're often doing is kind of quibbling over the details as to which technologies we're happy to to accept and which ones we think are morally wrong. So the obituary was um, a, a really a, a way of thinking about how we might reappraise Lance Armstrong in the future in a world in which being cyborg is is considered normal. Now, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, what matters to most people in this world is not so much enhancement it's cheating so the the problem with with lance armstrong is that he will always be seen as somebody that has broken the rules and so other people have been disadvantaged and in order to for him to be successful but the proposition i had which was in thinking about this obituary was in a world where we actually think about enhancement as something that is acceptable and that we may then reappraise armstrong and not as a villain but as a hero as a pioneer of new forms of 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 making us better than well to to coin a phrase actually from a from a book that i sort of read many years ago that really influenced my thinking and and actually my entry into this was through there was a group that was set up in in canada called the enhancement technologies group led by carl elliott who was doctor turned sort of bioethicist and they came over to london in 1998 and i i went along to the meeting met and this but when people like also nick bostrom were starting off at uh, at Oxford and um, and we we sort of talked about these possibilities and I think that what really sort of struck me as really interesting about the Lance Armstrong case was that we we might find ourselves in the future actually not thinking that doping is wrong but actually seeing it as a necessity and I think for me that's that's what the cyborg is is predominantly about it's moving into a situation where in fact technology is the foundation for evolution and that our integration and our, our success as a species will be predicated on our willingness to actually ready ourselves for an increasingly difficult environment. And that involves necessarily technology. So this is the idea of Lance Armstrong as the hopeful monster. Yeah, that's a good way. Of right, it. right. Yeah. I mean, that's what yeah. you're suggesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, people. I, I will say that people did. You know, I've seen lots of people that just say, you know, he's not a nice guy and not someone that you'd actually want to have as your hero. But but the point is about whether, in fact, those sorts of activities are something we would describe as monstrous. And I think that the problem is that the cyborg has certainly in sport, but more widely, and I'm sure you may talk about this uh, in other sessions. But the, it is very much seen as a kind of monstrous concept that people are very anxious about the sort of fundamental. Transform. I mean, Francis Fukuyama 20 years ago described it as kind of factor X and this idea that 
if we remove factor X, we remove our humanity and become this monstrous other. And I think that's where you know, even people like John Turney with his book on Frankenstein's footsteps, the reason why Frankenstein is often invoked, because it's seen as in, in, incorrectly, I would say, it's seen as this kind of monstrous other, when in fact we know that Frankenstein's monster became monstrous because of the absence of humanity and was shown by people. I mean, yes. that's the thing. <laughs> exactly. I mean, what, what, one thing, I, I, we, we need to move on, but, but one thing I want to point out about this obituary, by the way, we're, I have a copy of it, and I, and, 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 but, but I, I'm not sure where it came, uh, wh where was it published exactly? You know what, Steve? I don't know. I can't remember whether I... Yeah, yeah, because I've got a copy of it. But the point yeah. I, 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 uh, I want to make about it that I remember, that I think is worth pointing out here too, is that part of what you say in the obituary is that people got tired of the anti-doping stuff or in a way found it very hard to implement over time, that it just became this kind of nightmare, right? Because you're always chasing after something that's already happened, right? And people after a while thought, this is a crazy way of operating. And so then this whole pro-doping group gets organized that champions Lance Armstrong, right? And, and eventually resuscitates his legacy. I mean, this is kind of how you present it in the obituary. And, and that might be what happens, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, one sort of small detail is that to, over the years, as you can imagine, the sports world have not been terribly comfortable with these ideas. <laughs> I mean, I, I've had colleagues that have you know, been in very, very much sort of professional jeopardy as a result of writing things with me and making arguments like this, who have then sort of lost positions because there's just no, I mean, there's no wavering in the sports world from this view. If you want to end your career, you know, argue in favor of, of doping. And that, I think that's the problem is that it's such a kind of normative I mean, there's a dogma really about it that is, I think for me, what, what interested me about the genetics debate was that it seemed, and I think still does, step outside of that historic doping discussion and actually say, well, here are some technologies that actually, they're not associated with antisocial behavior, criminality, whatever it might be. They're actually ways in which we can enhance ourselves and ready ourselves for the 21st century. And so I think of, of, of technology as our savior because i think that increasingly our biology will, will require it as we move increasingly into more more difficult environmental circumstances and i think that transition is the bit that sports still aren't quite comfortable with yet okay so we don't have too much more time yeah. but there's going to be a lot i, I want you to that we'll cover let's say in five to ten minutes okay so let's just be prepared for that um the first thing, uh, and I think this is kind of an important thing for the conference as a whole, is this business of the of the transitioning from human to cyborg, which which you kind of present as this is the way to think about cyborgs. But you know that there are people who think cyborgs ought to be treated differently, right? In other words, this is not an issue about whether, I mean, because of course there are people who think we shouldn't have cyborgs and they don't deserve rights and all of that, but put those people to one side. There are people who are cyborg activists, like Neil Harbison, you're familiar mm. with him, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So there's cyborg activists who believe that cyborgs deserve rights, deserve recognition, but deserve to be recognized as separate kinds of persons, right? And so the issue of personhood as something separate from humanity, right, which in law is possible, right? So in law is possible, um, you know, uh, it, it is an issue. Um However, my, se I, 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 my, my sense is, though, that you don't buy that, that in some sense you believe that there is some kind of almost evolutionary thing going on where we're going to evolve into cyborgs, we're already evolving into cyborgs, and it'll just be, you know, we'll, there'll just be more cyborganization, and eventually our ethics will catch up with it. I mean, is, I mean, is this kind of generally where you're coming from? I mean, I, I do sort of subscribe to those ideas about personhood and, and you know, we have seen and I think we are still seeing a period of transition where societies are becoming increasingly willing to, at the very least, begin to recognize non-human animals as persons with moral status equivalent to humans. In, in many cases, I'm thinking of the, the case of India and dolphins and then, you know, these are. And, and we see similar sorts of conversations around uh, around octopuses and. and it's yeah, yeah, but that, let, let me interrupt you. Yeah. Um, the thing about cyborgs, though, that makes this this comparison difficult, because look, the point here is that animals can have rights and humans can have rights and they can be separate rights because from an evolutionary perspective, they actually have evolved differently. But in the case of cyborgs, 
right? We're generally talking about a human who becomes something else, hmm. right? So we're starting with the human as being the source, the locus of the, the normative conception of rights. And then we're having a bunch of people say, okay, because of my enhancements, right? I'm now something else and I deserve a separate kind of right. Okay. And this is what people like Harbison are saying. So what do you make of that? I mean, I think broadly speaking, I'm supportive of that, Steve. I think that actually one of the problems we have of, of rights discourses is the quite narrow lens through which we think about a, a human and what, they're, what they require from us in terms of moral duty. And, and that, I think, also historically has been informed by relatively narrow lenses as well. So I think that if you look at what's happened over the last 60 years with disability rights movements as well, you know, some would argue we're far below recognising what we conventionally call you know, humans, not cyborgs, as, as actually worthy of the sort of respect that everybody deserves. Okay, so but I think look, if, I, if I may interrupt you, look, um, when we have expanded the scope of human rights over the over the since let's say the 17th century when when it started to become popular um right we had to bring in women blacks right you think about it it was originally mm. kind of a white male project mm. we brought in all kind people from different classes all the rest of it and this took a stretching a kind of stretching of what was covered under the concept but it was still covered under the concept of human rights i mean the, the idea that humans are homo sapiens was a, 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 a nice biological protective cover over this in a way. Um, but the point is, the concept as it developed over time, human rights, right, required a, you know, a, a lot of stretching to incorporate all these other people who, in a sense, were not intended to be part of it. Now, why can't the cyborg be part of that story rather than having a separate set of rights as if it were another species? Well, you know, I'm not sure I've argued that it should have a separate set of rights. I mean, if, if Neil's position is, is that, then... Well, uh, that, that is kind of his position, that, actually. That, that sense it's a kind of subspeciation. But the, but, the, but the concept becomes irrelevant if you approach it from personhood rather than humanness. It becomes then um, moot as to what... You, I mean, you take somebody that has a, um, a kind of implant, let's say it has had a pacemaker fitted in their bodies that is then literally keeping, keeping them going. Now, I think on, on certainly many conventional definitions of cyborgs not even radical ones would would happily to construe that as a cyborgian device and you would want that person to be able to enjoy the, the rights that they have presently however a lot of the um a lot of the rights that they have are frustrated by the fact that this is not their device it's managed by okay. a medical system that then also will claim ownership of it yeah and, that, that's and, a different okay but that's but, a different uh, yeah yeah no 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 but now you're getting into the issue of the boundaries of, of one person versus another person, right? The person who can get into you versus you being able to control them uh, from getting into you. Well, it's, it's more, I think, a question about if your body consists of, I mean, if your body or your mind or aspects of your biology consist of products or substances that rely on external others in order to sustain your life and allow you to enjoy the fullness that life offers us as, as, a, as a species, let's say, then what should be the nature of that relationship? You know, is it is that what, what are the obligations of those technology companies to it to support that life going forward? And also, I think what are the obligations of, of us? Physician the, patient. Sorry. Physician patient. Well, I think that, I think the reality is actually that that physician patient uh, concept isn't appropriate in a world where we are talking about cyborgian technologies. It may work in in the, in some limited way when we're talking about. You know, the best that we can do is implant something, otherwise you're dead. But actually, if the best we can do is actually implant, implant something so that you can run faster than somebody else, you know, there's not a clear sort of medical need for that that would then underpin the current ethical frameworks that that permits. So the reason why sports hate drugs is not so much that they're against the use of drugs in society, it's that medical licenses on technologies or products or services or substances is incredibly narrow. And so it's the application outside of that narrow context that leads it to be morally problematic. And I think that that's where the concept of, of human rights certainly should evolve towards personhood rights. And I do think uh -huh. that accommodates cyborgs far more effectively. And it should. I think that's something I would absolutely argue for. I don't think I think in that sense, it's maybe that, yes, there are additional rights that cyborgs have. But the reality, I think, will be that 
that we are all cyborgs. We're all different types of cyborgs with different types of needs and recognitions required. So let me just get, because we're going to have to end this, uh, yeah. I think, <laughs> in a moment. Um, so is so just to get, get where, where your position is on the legal issue, you would actually prefer, so let's say the United Nations starts to reconsider the Declaration of Human Rights. You would, you would prefer it to be a declaration of personhood or de mm. person rights, which would be kind of broader than the concept of human because human has, you know, in a way, certain kinds of limitations on it that doesn't quite include all of the different ways in which people might be extended through cyborganization. Yeah, short answer is yes, Stephen. I think that's also the direction of, of a lot of a, a lot of philosophy as well. I think that's something that's becoming much more accepted. That doesn't mean to say that we're sort of comfortable with all these sort of radical transformations. I mean, the talks about, I remember conversations in sport where people would say, well, it's, if we have a, a prosthetic that's better than biology, will people end up then wanting to amputate limbs in order to have the biological, the, the prosthetic counterpart? Well, yes. Yeah, <laughs> which, uh, which may Which be happens. Well, it's, it's, it does, I mean, it sort of, it may be a good idea in some sense, but actually, you know, you might be able to become an elite athlete and be very successful. But um, if you look at some of the early pictures of Oscar Pistorius in his kind of cheetah legs, as they were called, <laughs> He's often sort of leaning against something because they're they're great for running, but actually standing still is really hard. And and one of the challenges I think we have is to design cyborg technologies that are sufficiently adaptable and as as varied in terms of their capabilities as biology has been. Which is why I think the the cyborg narrative has has moved very much from the mechanical to the biological as a concept. So we think about you know, nano molecular sized bots that then become infused with that biology and break down those barriers. The best forms of technology are those that often imitate nature. Let me tell you something. I know that's a nice thing to say, but if I think the issue is just the legal restrictions on being able to do it, because if mm. the legal restrictions were removed, people would make trade-offs. People mm. would make trade-offs and they wouldn't see the biology as the gold standard necessarily. They'd mm. be willing to, let's say, have the Oscar Pistorius problem if they're able to run fast and they can win Olympic games. There are people who will do that if they're allowed the opportunity to do that. And so it's the legal restriction mm. at the moment that actually stops this from happening. It's not the idea that there's some biological gold standard that somehow prevents the uh, technology from doing everything we want it to do. People will settle for less if it gives them something else instead. Yeah. They will exchange. They will exchange their qualities. And I think we see those trade-offs as uh, quite a lot in lots of aspects of society. I mean, there's a philosopher, Joel Feinberg, who talked about what would be sort of acceptable forms of, of enhancements. And it would be those that he described that would maximize the range of possibilities that your future may have. So we talked about it as an open future. So if you do something that is very sort of narrow as, a, as an enhancement, that's just for one particular kind of activity, that would betray this sort of openness pro uh, um, principle. And those may be the limits of where we sort of allow people to modify themselves. I think one aspect of this that is lost in the conversation also is about things that we do that involve then other people doing for us. And that's, I think, another component of this because it's then what can we do ourselves to modify ourselves, but, but then what do we also need other professionals to do for us? And that's where this discourse, I think, is connected to fundamentally, Steve. I think it's about uh, uh, delimiting parameters of what sort of life is acceptable. I, I saw recently there's a new a company that's developed um, essentially kind of end of life pods. So if you do want to end your life, they can provide this apparatus then you can go into it and just simply initiate the process of your of your death and and that's to empower people to take control of that rather than have to rely other, on other people to do things for them but it, it does come down to i think the trade-off that that society has between quality of life and and the sorts of lives that it thinks people should be leading okay well look andy this is great this is great stuff we could go on talking about <laughs> drones in the metaverse. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I would recommend to everyone here to uh, follow him on Twitter because you can then get a kind of ongoing real time sense of what he's up to. He puts out a lot of short videos, you know, giving his thoughts about things and they're worth watching. Uh, but other than that, Andy, I want to thank you very much uh, for, for spending the time uh, talking to us about what is likely to be our future.